Good morning, church. We would invite you to stand. Let's begin our morning by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Sing with joy now, our God is for us, the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress, raise your voice now, no love is greater, who can stand against us if our God is for us? ready for the next song, why don't you turn to somebody around you and tell them how thankful you are for Daylight Savings Time this morning. <laughs>
you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Oh, mm-hmm. 
Thank you for worshiping with us. At this time, we're gonna dismiss kids aged kindergarten through third grade out the back doors to class that's designed for them. And yes, you may be seated. Well, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to welcome you to Pleasant View. If this is your first time or first couple of times here, we hope you've already been made to feel welcome. And uh, we do have a connect kiosk in either lobby. If you are among your first couple of visits here, please introduce yourself to us there and we have a gift for you. We'd love to hear your story and how we might be able to become a part of it. Just a couple of quick announcements. We are going to be holding a Passover Seder celebration here uh, in the church, in the gym on Good Friday. And so if, you, um, if you're available, we'd love to have you come join us. It is not a full meal. It is just an, uh, an observation of the elements of that um, ceremonial meal. And so come having eaten dinner, otherwise you will be disappointed. Um, but we, uh, we would love to have you come and you can sign up on the app or on the website or just let the office know that you're coming. We do need to make sure we have an accurate ha- head count so that we have enough food and uh, place settings for those who come. Um, and uh, we are going to take this opportunity to have John Doherty come and give us an update on the parking lot project and some of the things that he's discovered. Good morning. As Jason said, I'm John Doherty. I'm one of the trustees here at the church, and um, we need to, we thought we ought to come to you and explain to you why we think the parking lot needs uh, replaced. Um, mostly it's because of the age of the parking lot. The parking lot was put in in the late 80s, early 90s, and um, there, when they did that, they really didn't have a good foundation when they, when they did that. They pretty much just laid the asphalt out on the clay. And because of that, we ended up with this you know, 30 some years old and we have, now we have deep cracks um, where the water's got in through the cracks and it softened the clay and washed it away and now we got these deep cracks. And also we have a lot of what I call alligatoring or spider web cracking in the parking lot and those um, turn into potholes because as they break up, they will um, move around and become missing. The next thing you know, you have a pothole. And a lot of that is, comes from living in Indiana um, Indiana's weather, a lot of freezing and thawing. It just causes um, all the parking lots and roads and everything, as you guys know, um, to fall apart. Now, we have taken some steps over the years to um, patch large areas, especially out here in the south lot. Um, and you can see where those are already starting to fall apart here, as you can see here. They're already starting to um, have the spider web cracking and um, won't last very long at all, even though they're just, you know, a handful or less years old. Um, um, we have, um, so when they're going to um, come in and fix our parking lot or replace it, they're gonna actually come, down, come in and take the asphalt out and take get down and get a good foundation built back up um, so that our asphalt will last the next time hopefully another 10 or so or 15, 20 years longer than it did now. Um, then we have some areas that over here, especially on the north east side where uh, we have some gravel and no asphalt. And while we're doing this project, it just makes sense to go ahead and have those places filled in and with asphalt. And so that it just brings it all up to the same, same um, quality. Um, the second reason um, is because we need more parking. Um, if you come on a, especially I imagine last Sunday we had a full house. And I think the parking lot was over full last Sunday. And so with this project, we're going to gain, gain more parking. We're going to expand um, to the west and to uh, a little bit to the north to make it so you can drive through is easier as well. Um, and if you had to, if you would come for the first time and you were, visiting our church and you had to park across the street and walk in, that wouldn't leave a very good um, thoughts in your mind of, of the first impression of our church. So we, we want to give our first impressions of our church. So I hope you understand the vision of the trustees and why we think that the, the, the asphalt and the, needs to be replaced. And um, if you have any questions, um, just free, feel free to find me and uh, I can sure answer them. I know this was just a short brief um, reason or presentation that I brought to you today, but I, we can go into it in depth in person. So thank you. Hello. 
total cost of this project is uh, $315,000. That price is good through the end of this uh, construction season. And when we asked them here recently, when's the latest they need to know, yes or no, are we planning to do that this year or not? Uh, they said end of June, very beginning of July at the latest. So that, that's coming up whether we're going to do that or not. Now we have talked at a congregational meeting about the possibility potentially of, of um, borrowing some of that money in order to do that now. That certainly hasn't been decided and ultimately that would have to be a congregational vote Either way, if we were to do that or if we were to postpone the project, if all of the funds are not in by that time. So in saying that, we are encouraging the congregation to prayerfully think about and consider what your part financially might be. I know everyone in this room, if you're a regular attender here and this is your church, everybody's in very different places financially and, and how much money you have and what your income looks like. And, and so we realize that the answer of what your part might be if, if this is your church is gonna look significantly different. Uh, but just sometimes it's helpful for us to sort of break it down into manageable chunks and think about it from you know one spot. Like so, how much does one parking spot cost if I were to try to consider you know to pay for the the amount of space that I park on each Sunday? And if you break up the amount of the the total project versus how many spots are projected to be there, it's about two thousand dollars per parking space. And so one way to think about it is, could I could I um, provide that much money toward the pro project uh, to, to pay for my spot. Again, the answer for some of you is gonna be no, that's just more than you could come up with. And so what we just wanna encourage you to think about is well, what could you contribute if, if this is your church? Again, I'm not speaking to visitors or, or anything, but if this is your church and, and uh, you participate regularly here, uh, you know, what we're doing is we're going to set a date of May 5th. There's nothing special about that date per se, but sometimes it also helps just to, to put a date on the calendar to say this is a date we're going to encourage people uh, to, to, to give to that project in particular. And so that's eight weeks away. So if you said, you know, I've got a really tight budget, I really don't have much uh, of anything in the bank that I could use to give to that, maybe you could look at it and say, could I find a way to carve out $20 a week to set aside between now and May 5th, which would provide you with $200 that you could bring in eight weeks to contribute toward that project. So that's just one way you might think about that. And um, certainly whatever you do, we want it to be done prayerfully and uh, certainly not under compulsion or feeling like you're being uh, arm twisted. That certainly isn't the spirit that I want anyone to hear today. So encourage you to be praying for this and thinking about this project and we'll we'll pray and hope that the lord leads us so that come june we'll have clarity on how we move forward i believe we have the pastoral prayer next i'm guessing the person that scheduled might not be here so i'm going to go ahead and pray for us All right. heavenly father lord we are thankful and grateful for uh, your sending of Jesus to this earth to lead for us as an example of how we should live and ultimately to, to voluntarily take our place on the cross. Lord, we, we recognize and we express to you in humility that uh, we deserved to be the ones who paid the penalty for our own sins. Uh, we have so often chosen a path of selfishness and rebellion against you and Yet in grace and mercy, you sent Jesus to bear that for us and to invite us freely to come and receive salvation through you. And so we, we're here each week uh, that we can be here to just get together and thank you for that and sing songs of praise to you for all that you do, especially for the way that you've saved us and graciously uh, invite us into your presence and to yourself. Father, I pray this morning we have many in our church who are suffering. I think of the Wilson family who, uh, 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 for Bambi, as uh, uh, she uh, 
makes provision for the funeral for her husband, uh, for Steve, and I just uh, pray for them and uh, that you would be with them, uh, with her during this time and, and the broader family as they uh, celebrate his life. And uh, we're thankful for the life that he had and that he is with you and that his suffering has come to an end. Uh, Father, I pray for others in our church. There's a lot of sickness and suffering of, uh, to various degrees. We, we do ask for your healing. We know that sickness is a part of living in, a, in an imperfect world uh, that is yet to be fully redeemed and restored. We long for that day, but in the meantime, we pray for those who are sick and who are weak, uh, who are aging and find life much more difficult. I just lift up our congregation to you for your, your strength and your emotional and spiritual encouragement to be felt for them. Lord, I pray for our missionary family. We just pray for the outreach into our community here as well as around the world. And there's all different struggles and uh, hurdles that uh, various ones face depending on the part of the world where they serve. And we just lift them all up to you collectively and ask for your spirit to to uh, remove obstacles and to soften hearts and prepare people for the gospel through various efforts. And uh, we'll give you all the praise and glory for the work that you do in those lives as the gospel goes out. And as we'll even see this morning in the message, that it is a powerful work that, uh, that um, moves hearts to receive you as their savior. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. I don't know, let me turn my mic on, sorry, get situated here. I don't know if you have, if you have ever seen a uh, speed painter or a speed artist, and uh, they will oftentimes do a performance in front of an audience where they will very, very quickly put, put together a work of art. Sometimes they'll have, they'll be using both hands. They sometimes will have two paintbrushes in each hand and, and they're just going to work really quickly uh, and, and they make a work of art. Well, I, I've got a, a video and I've sped it up just a little bit. It's just a little over a minute, but, but it was about a minute and a half that this artist did her work. This is uh, kind of like America got it's got talent, but it's some other European country. I'm not sure which one, but just you can kind of watch as she does a very quick piece of art. You'll notice if you know how the show works, if the performance isn't being judged as going all that well, the judges there will kind of push their button on the X, and, and if all four judges hit their X, it's, you're done. It's sort of like it's, it's a no. So, you know, here they are with three judges saying, yeah, I don't think so, and now the fourth. So... So it was kind of cool. I mean, the judges are there. They're watching this work of art being done, and it looks kind of like a somewhat corny, cartoonish drawing, and it's like, eh, not that special. And then after that, it's like, then it starts just looking like a bunch of hodgepodge of mess. It's like there's this black tar-looking stuff that's being put on it, and then something else below, and it's just looking like a wreck and a mess of stuff. And you can see the looks of the people in the audience. They're kind of like trying to figure out what's happening. You can tell there's a bit of a disapproval in their minds that they're not impressed. And, and all four judges give her the X. And then, and then she flips it around, throws what I think is, must have been chalk on there. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, she was actually doing a masterpiece work of art. And, and they just couldn't see it yet. And I thought that it was a great illustration for this morning what I want us to consider for uh, the message, because we're going to be in Acts chapter 8 this morning. And in Acts chapter 8, we'll see the church coming under some stiff persecution. And I have to imagine if you had lived there in Jerusalem at the time where Stephen has just been martyred, first martyr of the church that we know of, that's recorded, and, and you have 
the Apostle Paul, he's not yet known as the Apostle, he's just Saul of Tarsus, he is beginning to persecute severely, haul people off, men and women to prison, put some to death, we'll find out later in his writings, and it's just some severe persecution. But what we see in Acts chapter 8 is that the, the immediate result of that persecution is that the kingdom spreads. And the people leave Jerusalem to get away from the persecution, and they go into the surrounding regions, and they take the gospel with them. And, and, the, and the kingdom grows, and what you see is that what, what was felt to be great pain and hardship and difficulty, the sovereign God uses it with great purpose. And so I've entitled the message, There's Purpose in the Pain. In the same way that what appeared to be random stuff going on a, on a black canvas wasn't random at all. It was actually being purposefully used by that artist. Well, as I mentioned, two weeks ago we, we started, we looked, well, two weeks ago was the last time we were in Acts. We took a break last week. And, and in the last passage there in Acts, we saw the death or the martyrdom of Stephen in chapters 6 and 7. But we were introduced to an important character that's going to come up, and he's going to be central throughout the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 58, as the story of Stephen was coming to an end, we read this, Then they cast Stephen out of the city, and they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so we see this young man, Saul, that comes up in chapter 7 and verse 58, and then in chapter 8 and verse 1, Saul is mentioned again, and it says, and Saul approved of his, of his execution. Scholars suggest that Paul was very likely, from what we know of him as a religious Pharisee, as a, a religious leader, he was probably part of the council that got together in um, reference in, in Acts 6.12 and 6.15, those who were trying Stephen and listening to his argument. Paul was probably a part of that council, and then when the execution was happening, he was there holding the coats, witnessing it in great approval. In Acts 9, one chapter later, we'll see that, that he is described, Saul is described as still breathing out threats of murder against the church. But in chapter 9, it's also where he encounters the risen Jesus, and he becomes a follower himself. However, I think that it's likely, and this is going to be point number one in your outline, and I'll hopefully be able to, to make this point, is that I believe God used Stephen's execution to plant a seed in Saul. And I think it's implied here in the passage that, that Paul is beginning to think about this Christianity and that he, we, there's some evidences here that he was impressed and that his heart was impacted, even if we might call it a delayed impact. In other words, his immediate impact was he's approving of it. That's what it says. He's approving of what's going on. There's no evidence that immediately he responds to it. But as we see, he gets saved in chapter 9. And what we know about Luke, Luke is the one that wrote Acts. We know Luke tells us that he wrote as a historian the things that, weren't, that he wasn't a direct eyewitness of. He spoke to other witnesses who were there. And he got their information about the event, and that's how he would collect their words. Or he'd go back and read other people that wrote about it, and he would collect these various witness accounts, and then he would write his work. And so the question is, well, where did Luke get his information about Stephen's execution? Well, there's only one person who's mentioned by name as being there that Luke knows for sure was there, and it's Saul. He mentions him by name. And we know that Luke and Saul were, were companions throughout some of Saul. Later, he's going to be referred to as Paul throughout his, his work and his ministry. And so, almost certainly, the story of Stephen was relayed to Luke through Paul. So now if you go back and you look at just some of the details that were told to us, and you think of it, okay, this is probably coming from Paul, what does it tell us about how this event had impacted him likely? In chapter 6 and verse 10, Luke makes this point. It says, but they could, they referring to the council, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen was speaking. 
Now, how would Luke know that the council, as they met privately to discuss this, couldn't come up with, with a, a good explanation to refute what he was saying, that they were more or less stumped? Again, we, I, think it's, I think it's rational, it's reasonable to assume the Apostle Paul, who probably sat on that council, told him after the fact, you know, in hindsight, looking back, yeah, we couldn't come up with an answer. We were pretty much stumped. Like, we didn't have a good comeback for the things he was saying. Likewise, in chapter 6 and verse 15, we're told, And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Well, again, how does Luke know that everybody that sat at that council saw him of having a face that glowed? I have to assume that the Apostle Paul, who was likely on that council, was there, and they discussed it amongst themselves and said, Do you see what I see? Like, is his face glowing really brightly? Yeah, I see it too. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely glowing. Huh. There's a sense in which, you know, after the fact, looking back, I have a feeling Paul's like, you know, if I wasn't so stubborn and already had my mind make up, made up, I should have been convinced. I would have been convinced. There was probably a hardness of heart there, like we see all throughout the religious leaders in the ministry of Jesus. It doesn't matter all the miracles that they witness, yet still somehow they're able to execute Jesus and pretend that, that he wasn't who he claimed to be. But I think Paul was clearly impacted, even if it's just in seed form that the seeds were planted in the life of Paul. Maybe he was even thinking about that encounter and, and recounting what Stephen said in his speech and how he confronted the people like Paul and the others on that council, that you're just like all of your forefathers, all of your ancestors before you. You killed all of the prophets. It's no wonder you killed Jesus when he finally shows up. Did that gnaw at Paul? Was there a part of him that thought about that and thought, gosh, I don't like that reality? Later, after he was saved, how much did Peter's presentation of the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus stir Paul as he thought about his own teaching and as he then put the pieces together of the Old Testament to, to, to see it through the lens of Jesus? How much did Stephen's boldness and the fact that Stephen wasn't afraid and that he even had a sense of joy and peace in the midst of his martyrdom, did that stick with Paul as he oftentimes faced the possibility of death? And he says, I'm not afraid to die. You know, his, his own friends are telling Paul throughout uh, Jerusalem, don't go back, or throughout, uh, throughout his life, don't go back to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you there. And Paul's like, so what? I'm going. I'm going. Gonna, I'm gonna. He, he had his heart set on getting back to Jerusalem because he believed that's where he needed to go for ministry. Where'd that boldness come from? The point is, I think what we see is that Stephen, despite having to go through such great pain and suffering in his death, and yet that experience God seems to have used in the life of Paul, who is going to go out and he's going to make a huge impact. Now, just sort of as a sidebar, uh, Saul or Paul and, and what happened there, I've, I've heard it said probably wrongly that that. God changed Saul's name to Paul when he gets saved. The Bible actually doesn't ever say that anywhere. Uh, more likely, he, as a lot of people did, they had different names, a Jewish name, a Roman name, and in this case, Saul is the Jewish name. Paul was likely his Roman name. And what we see is that he goes by Saul, or he's described as Saul, up until chapter 13. Well, he gets saved in chapter 9. His name doesn't change yet. When you get to chapter 13, what, what's different? Why does he suddenly go by Paul throughout the rest of the book of Acts? And that's when he starts his missionary journey into Gentile territory. So my theory is he's going to go minister amongst Gentiles. He now goes by his more Gentile-like name rather than his Jewish name because Paul became all things to all people to, to identify better with them. And so his name will ch not so much change. He'll just go by uh, his other name in the latter half of the book of Acts. But you know, just coming back to the premise and that God uses difficulty and hardship to shape and to mold us. The truth is, many of you can point to things in your life, maybe either things that you've come through or things that you're in the midst of now, or maybe even things that realistically you're not going to come through until you, you, you receive your new resurrection body. 
and it's hard, and it can be painful, and it's difficult. It's like, how do we view those things? How do we keep those things from, from turning us bitter or angry or causing us to lose faith in Jesus? And the truth is, is that if we can see in, in stories like this one, that God uses, just like that artist in the beginning, when we can't oftentimes see what's going on and it appears kind of ugly to us and painful to us and we don't have access to the afterwards, long time after, in hindsight to look back and see, oh man, I had no idea God was using that issue in my life to impact that coworker or to impact my grandchildren or my children who maybe not even years later does it really even kind of, does the impact sprout forth like it's in seed form. And years later when your grandson is now in his 50s and he's going through a hard time and he re remembers back to how grandma or how grandpa handled a similar situation and, and suddenly now the impact is, is growing fruit. We don't have oftentimes that vantage point. And yet by faith, to be able to trust that a God who's made promises that he will use and take even the pain and the difficulty ultimately for our good, that he's at work. I've got a video testimony this morning of, uh, you know, many of you know Rick Klotz, a friend uh, of mine here, friend of many of yours, and Rick and I took a trip together uh, last year, and we talked quite a bit on that trip, and, and uh, some of the things, you know, Rick opened up a little bit about uh, a daughter that... Uh, passed away when she was young and the pain of that experience it's still still very painful uh, but just sharing how God used even that very painful situation in his life to 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 do a work in him to help him uh, I would say if you know Rick he's one of the most generous people you'll meet and he has a huge heart especially for people who are handicapped the people who who have um great disadvantages in their life, and he is drawn to them like a magnet, and he'll, he'll tell you in this testimony, much of it is because of, of the work that God did through uh, the, the story with his daughter. So we're going to watch that together. It's a few minutes long. In 1999, my wife and I had uh, would have been our third child at that time. Uh, her name was Carly. She was born with cerebral palsy. Uh, and the best way to describe that is she was just in a body she didn't know how to operate. And when she was first born, I thought I was being punished uh, for the way she was born, for something I'd done. And I thought, God, what did I do to deserve this? But after having her, uh, and it didn't take a long time at all, I realized, God, what did I do to deserve this? But it was that I was being blessed, that I didn't deserve it. Uh, 2002, June 30th, was probably the worst day of my life. We unexpectedly found uh, Carly passed away, deceased, and uh, she actually was put on a monitors and kept alive until that was on a Saturday night late and uh, Sunday morning, 7.30, 8 o'clock. The next morning she passed away at Lutheran Hospital. And so at that point, that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever went through in my life. Every day was a day you did not want to get up, but you had to. You have the other kids, you have everything going on, and just so many things just triggered uh, breakdowns. Uh, I remember coming to church and seeing somebody wearing the little coat that Carly used to wear, and I wanted to run out of the church. Uh, and just seeing her friends that are still going to the, the church today, the same age, watching them grow up, and she didn't grow up, was very hard. Uh, but as far as my, my faith went, I think in that time, I grew more than I ever have in my life. I read my Bible more in my life in that time. And looking back, is it something I would want to go through again? Not in the least. Uh, and if I was honest, I would say never. But as far as growing spiritually or whatever is closer to God, it was probably the best time in my life. And it becomes down to, I got to trust that God knows best. He knows best for me, so he knows best for Carly. And he knew what was best, and this is not our eternal home. You know, if it was up to me, I would have kept her for years and years and years and never let go. I think I shared with Mike one time, uh, I used to be a UPS driver for 33 years. And I, uh, 
I delivered North Manchester at that time. There was a place called Timbercrest as a uh, retirement park. And there was a little boy in there with uh, Down syndrome. And uh, I'd get in my truck every day. I would walk right by him at the front desk. They had like a daycare in there apparently. And I'd walk right by him. And after Carly was born, I did the same thing. I walked by him one day and I went out and got in the truck and I actually put it in gear and started to take off. And it was just like somebody said, Rick, that's your daughter. So I pulled the emergency brake, shut the truck off, went back in and I just, I thought, what do I say to him? So I thought, well, like you do anybody, what's your name? And he looked at me with this big smile and said, David, what's your name? And, and I told him my name and I said, uh, hey, you want to pop? He goes, yeah. And so I took him down, uh, there was a pop machine there and bought a pop. So the next day, or actually that day when I left, I said, okay, David, I'm gonna see you tomorrow. Tomorrow is your turn to buy. And uh, he laughed and, uh, and so the next day come up and I said, hey, I think it was your turn. He said, no, it's my turn. So every day I end up buying a pop and him thinking he was tricking me that I kept forgetting on whose turn it was to buy this pop. But I guess the moral of the story is I, really did not notice this kid until I had a daughter like this kid and now I can't pass by a wheelchair without talking to him it's and it bugs me because I'll be in a hurry or something I will always take the time to go say hi what's your name and because uh, one thing I realized is they got their heart was installed by the same uh, owner as we have Jesus and they just express it in a different way so I uh, make a point to always talk to him. God used Stephen's execution to plant a seed in somebody's heart that bore fruit later in their life, made an impact. And similarly, then we're going to see, secondly, God used Saul's persecution of the church in Jerusalem to spread the gospel to Samaria. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. If you have your Bibles out, you can read along or you can follow on the screen. But uh, it says this, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen, and they made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he proclaimed to them the Christ. You see in verse 1 here, there's great persecution against the church. But no, notice the, the, the locales that are specifically mentioned. And again, if you're just a little bit of an observant reader, you're going to be like, wait a minute, I feel like I've heard these places before. You have the church in Jerusalem in verse 1. And from there, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Hmm. Jerusalem scattered into Judea and Samaria. Where have I heard that before? And again, it's Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. The, 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 the verse in Acts that is considered sort of the outline to the whole book where, where Jesus had predicted to his followers, the apostles, you will one day receive power in the near future. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and then in all Judea and Samaria and eventually to the end of the earth. And, and again, as you're reading this and your mind goes back to there, you were meant to read this through the lens of saying, oh, wow, this great persecution is happening. And yet I think God's bringing about what he said was supposed to happen. I mean, maybe... Maybe the people in Jerusalem were supposed to be going out on their own, and they hadn't, and so God allows this to happen to push them out, or, or maybe not. Maybe, you know, it wasn't that long that they were in Jerusalem and the church was growing and growing. But either way, this is being used to fulfill the prediction, the prophecy that was made in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It's interesting how often, you, you can look throughout history and see various times where this sort of thing has played itself out, where persecution has been brought about by the, by the hands of a government who's trying to squelch or stifle or put down the influence of a church, and it has the exact opposite impact. That isn't always the case. Sometimes persecution does 
really slow down and, and stop the growth of the church. But other times, it just magnifies the growth. There, a story I heard this week, and the person who told it wasn't totally sure it was true, so I have to repeat that, that I'm not positive this is true, but uh, what he had heard, what he has read, was that in the early days of the church in the, in the country of China, when it was growing, that uh, there was discussion amongst the, the Communist Party leaders, how do we stop this? How do we, how do we put an end to this? They had already kicked out the missionaries from China at that point, and somebody had the idea. They said, you know, from what I can tell, these Christians, they just love to gather together. They love to get together to worship, to sing songs, to talk about the Bible, to fellowship. And so the, the idea was, was posed what if we spread them out? What if we break them up so that they don't have those relationships? And so they took them from the, the, the cities and they forcibly made them move out into the, into the country away from the, the cities. And, you know, what happened? They took the gospel with them and it spread and a whole bunch more people came to faith. And the church in China grew immensely. That's the same sort of thing that we see happening here in Acts. The attempt was made to stifle it by the Jews who hated it, the Jewish leaders, but the exact opposite takes place. And again, we see that there's purpose behind this pain, that the suffering of the Christians isn't for nothing, that God uses it to expand the kingdom to others. That language of the kingdom is specifically mentioned here as Philip goes down in the following verses, and it says that he is preaching the kingdom of God. I want you to see two things here. Letter A in the outline is, first off, the surprising extent of the Samaritan reception to the gospel in verses 5 through 12. The, the, the surprising extent. Verse 5, it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and we don't, the scholars don't know what city this was. Samaria was a region, so some people think maybe it was the capital of Samaria. There was a city that sometimes was called Samaria. Some think it's that. There's other probably five or six suggestions that I came across uh, that people assume this might have been for various reasons. The bottom line is we don't really know what city, but some city in Samaria, Philip goes down to, and he proclaims to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so that there was much joy in the city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. We were introduced to this individual called Simon, Simon the magician. That idea of magic here is most likely a reference to the occult. He's, he's practicing the occult in some way, and because of that, uh, he's tapping into the powers of the demonic realm, and he is able to do amazing things. He's able to impress the crowds with, with amazing powers and such. In fact, verse 10, they mistake him as the real thing. They call him the power of God. You know, they're... they're, they're if you would ask the people in that region, where can the power of God be found? They would have said, oh, Simon, he's, he's the premier example of one who taps into the power of God. Of course, it was imitation. It was an imitation of the power of God. That's going to be important for later when we think about how this story fits. But to consider the scope of those that are impacted, which is brought out in these verses. In verse 6, we're told that the crowds, that implies a lot of people, the crowds were listening and paying close attention to Philip. We're told in verse 7, as he performed signs and wonders amongst the people, that many demons were cast out and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there's a large number of people who are experiencing healing in their life, both healing from demonic oppression as well as healing from physical issues. 
And then in verse 10, we're told they all, now here it's in reference to those who had been paying attention to Simon, but they all paid attention to Simon from the least to the greatest. This, this infatuation with Simon was, was pretty much universal there within Samaria. And then in verse 12, when it says they believed and were baptized, the implication is the they are the ones that have just been being talked about, including the all who paid attention uh, from the least to the greatest. So there's this sense of which this, this gospel is pervading this entire region. And this is especially surprising when you, you know, a lot of you know a little bit about the Samaritans and their relationship with the Jews. I mean, you've got... Jews coming from Jerusalem, spreading out into Samaria, which is surprising because Jews previously wouldn't have wanted to go and live there or interact with them. But the gospel and the Holy Spirit seems to have changed that mentality. You know, you see in the story of Jesus that the disciples, the apostles, at that point were surprised and they wanted Jesus to go all the way around Samaria. Take an extra day in your trip to avoid having to go through this horrible place with these horrible people. But now, when the persecution comes, they're going right into this area, and they're sharing the good news with these Samaritans. And the Samaritans are paying attention and listening and being impacted by it. And a good bit of that, I'm sure, had to do with the signs and the wonders that Philip is performing, and people seeing their their diseases healed and their, their paralysis going away and demons being cast out. I'm sure, just like with the ministry of Jesus, this is catching their attention. But it's surprising that Samaritans are so open to some Jewish people who were coming and sharing Christ. Beyond that, theologically, the Samaritans didn't believe just like the Jews did. The Samaritans had their own, uh, you know, they had their own, they only, they exclusively used the first five books of the Bible. They rejected the rest of the Old Testament scriptures that, that Jews would have used, and they were anticipating a Messiah, but he was going to come on a different mountain than, than what the Jews thought, and so they were looking for a different Messiah in their mind than what the Jews were, and so even though they had different presuppositions and their initial tendency would have been to have assumed that whatever the Jews are thinking and teaching is a little bit misguided, and yet here they are receiving broadly, almost universally in this area, they're receiving the gospel brought by Philip. And so there's this surprising extent of the reception of the gospel that is laid out here. But then secondly, we have a surprising example of the Samaritan reception to the gospel. Verse 13. Now, we've already been introduced to Simon. He is the premier example of one who has the power of Satan, who is a false imitation of God. And yet verse 13 says what? Even Simon himself believed. I mean, this gospel is so pervasive, it has such an impact that even Simon himself believes. Now, in verses 14 through 17, I'm not going to read it, but uh, the, the apostles in Jerusalem get word and they find out what's taking place in Samaria. And so they send Peter and John to go down and look into it and discover for sure what's taking place. And um, when they get there, Peter begins to interview some of the Samaritans who had received Christ, and they ask them, well, have you received the Holy Spirit yet? Have you had the Holy Spirit come upon you? And they say, no, we haven't. And so Peter begins to lay his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Now, some, I think, mistakenly read verses like this and assume that, you know, you get saved, and then you've got the Holy Spirit coming later on you. Some, there are some charismatic things uh, the um, groups, that would be their theology. They would see this as sort of a second coming of the Holy Spirit. But I think what we have here is a unique situation. Throughout the book of Acts, as the gospel goes to new territory, the first time it came to the Jews, you have these amazing, spectacular events demonstrating this is real. And then as you have the gospel for the first time going into Samaritan territory, you've got this pause where the, the apostles come to legitimize it and to make it very clear, hey, this is exactly what's happening in Jerusalem, only now it's spread beyond the Jews. And they're laying their hands on and they're receiving the Holy Spirit after the fact, only because God was making sure that it was very clear that this is connected to what was happening in Jerusalem. And later you'll see a similar thing when it extends to the Gentiles. So Peter's laying hands on them. 
they're receiving the Holy Spirit, and it's implied, it's, we're not told here, but it's implied that they must have received the Spirit, and there must have been some miraculous evidences of that. Uh, probably they were speaking in tongues or other languages that they hadn't otherwise known, as, as others that received the Spirit do in Acts, because whatever's happening to them, they realize, oh, wow, now we're receiving the Spirit. Before, they hadn't experienced that, but now they are, and Simon takes notice. Because Simon sees what's happening, and he is amazed at the power that is exhibited by Peter laying hands on them. And in verses 18 and 19, Simon offers Peter money. He says, how much would it cost for me to get that power, is basically what he says. Simon must have been wealthy. He probably made a lot of money off of his own powers. But he obviously notices this is a much greater power than I've ever had. Whatever signs and wonders were being exhibited there and demonstrated as people received the Spirit, I think it's implied that Simon's like, wow, that even impresses me. And so he asks Peter, what do I need to do to get that kind of power? How much can I buy it for? In verses 20 through 24, Peter rebukes his request. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, the matter of laying hands on people and giving the Holy Spirit to them. For your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven for you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness, or some might say jealousy. Sort of that idea of he really wanted something that he didn't have. It's probably what's implied in that word. And you are in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, there's a lot of debate. Uh, and probably what goes through your and my mind as we read this is, what do we make of this? Is, is he a believer or isn't he a believer? Was, was this, you know, a genuine follower of Jesus or not? What are we supposed to make of Peter's words? And there's, you know, you can make a pretty decent case both ways. I mean, in favor of him being a true believer, well, he is said back in verse 13 to have believed and he was baptized. And it says, and he followed after Philip. And so there's this implication of he continued on. But... Then he makes this crazy request, and Peter's, the harshness of Peter's rebuke causes you to think that maybe Peter doesn't think he's a, a, the, the real deal. You know, at one point he says, may your money perish, or may you perish with your money. Sounds like he's saying, you know, eternal judgment is going to come upon you. It doesn't have to be understood that way. The perishing there, maybe it's like an Ananias and Sapphira event where, you know, he's basically saying, this is severe enough. You don't want God to strike you dead. You better repent. When Peter tells him to repent, he does seem to, to take it well. He says, yeah, I don't want this to come upon me. Please pray for me that these things don't happen. So there seems to be a soft, repentant attitude, and yet others will point out, but he doesn't actually, it doesn't tell us that he actually prays to repent. In fact, he asks Peter to do it. Maybe he doesn't feel like he's got that relationship with God. And then on top of all of this, you've got quite a few references from early church fathers and people that wrote, you know, in the, in the hundred years afterwards or so, they reference several different places, this guy, Simon Magus or Simon the Magician, and it's always negative. They, they, in fact, uh, Justin Martyr, who was from the area of Samaria, who wrote about a hundred years after this event would have taken place, writes about this Simon individual and, and says that he, he went around with a former prostitute and, and he had a whole false message of, of a whole false gospel, a whole, like, uh, was a false teacher where he himself was the Messiah figure and uh, kind of taking on the, the persona he would have had before he was saved. Now, some scholars think that that probably isn't accurate, that maybe even Justin Martyr was mistaking this guy for another guy named Simon. And, and I won't go into some of that. It gets complex. But the point is, when you read here in chapter 8, my take is we're, not, we're left without any sort of clarity one way or the other. It wasn't written to tell us whether he was a true believer or not. That's not really the point. So what is the point? And I think there's a couple things that, that are the point. The first is this. The gospel was so successful that, as verse 13 says, even Simon believed. 
at least initially, he made an initial, even Simon recognized what was taking place and had an initial response to the word of God being preached and wanted to be a part of it. And in addition to that, there's this, there's this literary foil between Simon and Philip because Simon was the great miracle worker in this area. Everybody revered him as the power of God until what? Until Philip showed up. Philip had the real thing. Philip had the Holy Spirit. And as soon as Philip showed up and was casting out demons and healing people, everybody from the least to the greatest immediately recognized, wait a minute, that's way better than what Simon does. We want to be a part of that, not this. Even Simon recognizes it so much so that he wants to buy that kind of power for himself because he realizes the superior power of the Holy Spirit over whatever power he had. And I think the text is making that point, that the Holy Spirit's power, the power of God, is so evidently greater than anything this world has to offer. Any sort of power or mystique or attraction that the things of this world have to offer, the gospel message is so much greater. And then finally, just by way of an application from this, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, evangelism can be messy. And by that I mean the gospel gets shared and somebody responds and we want to rejoice with them and we're excited and maybe even it's somebody that has, you know, they're, they're renowned or they're well-known and they make a decision to follow Jesus and then a few months later, maybe a year later, they don't really show a whole lot of evidence that they're really following Jesus. And it can be discouraging, and you might think, well, that was a waste, or that wasn't real. And I think what we see is that even, even the Apostle Philip, even when, well, not the Apostle Philip, even Philip, as he is the evangelist, as he is sharing the gospel, he has those kinds of converts, people that he leads to Jesus, people that are phenomenal examples, the kinds of people you want to record and tell people about, hey, even Simon got saved. And then they maybe don't, don't continue on. That, that's on them. It shouldn't discourage us that sometimes it's, it's kind of messy. Jason and I were talking about this in our staff meeting this week, and both of us have stories of people that we can think back on and remember who made professions of faith and initially demonstrated clearly that they were following Jesus. Then there's a long period of their life where they're just not at all living for the Lord at all. And yet, more than a decade later, they come back, they return, and they still credit their salvation way back 10, 15 years earlier. The point is, we don't know what's going on in people's hearts. We should be encouraged to share the gospel with people, and we should rejoice when they respond, even sometimes when it turns messy like here. But I want to come back as we kind of come to a close here soon, is just to the big idea. The big idea in this passage, again, I believe, is that God is using pain and suffering to bring about good things. And he calls us to walk by faith and trust him, even though the people in the moment couldn't see it. Stephen certainly didn't have a vantage point to see that God was using even his violent death to begin to do a work in somebody like Saul, who would go on to be a great apostle and evangelist. The many who were being hauled off to prison by Saul and were being forced out of their homes and going into country that they used to avoid to get away from persecution, most of them didn't have a vantage point to see how the church was spreading, especially those that were put to death by Saul. And the truth is, we today oftentimes don't have a vantage point to see what God might be doing in the bigger picture when we're going through hard times, when we're going through difficulty and pain. It's easy to miss and to have no idea what, what other people who are watching us are thinking and seeing and how it is planting seeds in their heart or how they are being primed to be impacted by that. But we're called to walk by faith and to love God in the midst of it and to love others and not to grow bitter and angry and hard-hearted and not to walk away from our profession of faith in Christ. Many people will take great comfort in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 where it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And that idea of working together for good in the context, it's pretty clear the good has to do with the good character of God that's being produced within us. That, it, that the glorifying, as to use a biblical term, that's used there, the, the, the word to glorify is sort of turn us into the image of Jesus. In fact, a little bit earlier in chapter 8, verse 18, 
Paul writes, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. In other words, one day in the future, there's going to be a glory, a character that is displayed in us, and it is being brought about even through the sufferings that we're going through in the present time. He says it elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, for this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That whatever the glory is, whatever the goodness is, it doesn't even compare to the momentary, in, in context, light affliction. There's a song that's popular right now entitled uh, Hold On by an artist, Katie Nicole. And uh, she shares in the song, she, she talks about you know, holding on during the tough times. She says that the song was born out of a tough time in her own life. And in hindsight, she had had a couple of back surgeries. She's relatively young still, but she had had a couple of back surgeries. She said she was going through a lot of pain. It was emotionally trying. And she went through a, a period where she had contemplated even taking her own life to escape the pain. And uh, she, at one point, there was a bottle of pills. And she had, was thinking about taking them. And as she was opening them in her bathroom, it slipped out of her hand. And the pills went everywhere on the floor. And she said in that moment, God got her attention. And she sensed he said to her, just hold on. I am not finished yet with your life. This, 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 your story has not yet been fully written. The chorus of that song says, hold on just a little bit longer. I know it's going to be okay. These days are going to make you stronger. You will find purpose in the pain. Hold on just a little bit longer. Deep down, there's a well of faith. Let hope arise as you're lifting up my name. I've asked my daughter to come and sing that song in closing. And when she's finished, the praise team will come and lead all of us in a final song of praise. Smoke clouds all around Couldn't see your face Darkness consumed me Stuck in the bitterness But I know there's a light that's waiting up ahead So I'll say in the fight and look to the one who said Just hold on The promise still stands It's chasing after me The rainbow, the storm clouds It's how I'm gonna see That there is a light that's waiting up ahead so I'll say in the fight and look to the one who said, hold on just a little bit longer. I know it's going to be okay. These days are going to make you stronger. You'll find purpose in the pain. Gonna make you 
stronger. You'll find purpose in the pain. Hold on just a little bit longer. Deep down, there's a well of faith. Let hope arise as you're lifting up my name. And just hold on. Hold on. Hold on. And just hold on. Just hold on. Stand and close in a, a last song and raising a hallelujah, no matter what you might be going through at this moment. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is 